You know, Psalm 46 verse 5 tells us about a woman who has God within her. And such a woman can never fail, says the word of God. Why? Because God himself is her help at the break of dawn. And today, I am deeply honored to introduce you and to welcome in our midst one such woman who lives this reality in her life. And today she is here in our midst to teach us how to become such a woman who can have God in her midst, who can walk in victory because God is always her help. Would you like to become such a woman? Well, then let us put our hands together to welcome somebody very, very special whom God has chosen to come to us all the way from Divine Retreat Center, Kerala. Let us thank and praise God for the gift of Maria Sangeeta, who will share with us on the gift of femininity. Welcome, Maria. Praise the Lord. I can't tell you how happy I am to be here <laughs> after three years. And uh, Woman Alive is always such a wonderful experience of being home, hmm? uh, of, of being with people who, who love and whose life is about love. So friends, when we look at a Catholic joke book, you'd find a lot of jokes that, uh, that belong to Pope John the 23rd. Plenty of jokes. And I think soon uh, Pope Francis's jokes might, might exceed the jokes of John, Pope John the 23rd, Saint Pope John the 23rd. And um, if I were to ask you, uh, what would be the most uh, memorable joke that Pope Francis cracked? Could you make a guess? No? Okay, I'll tell you this one. I'm sure you heard it. So he was, I mean, the context I saw it was when he was in, in the U.S. and he was talking about uh, how there's no family and no home that is perfect, no community also, that's perfect. So he said there's no husband that's perfect and uh, no wife, husband not being perfect, we all know, right? And no, <laughs> no wife who is perfect, uh, you may be the exception. And then he paused and then he said, I don't even want to talk about the mother-in-law. <laughs> and then he pauses again. Hmm? He's got a lot of guts. He says, I don't have any mother-in-law. And then he says, but I wrestle with the devil often, so I know about it. And I, all the daughters-in-law are laughing, okay. <laughs> so, you know, I was thinking, we women have given so much of cheer to this world because I think there are uh, more jokes, no, more than the jokes about the Scots, uh, more than the jokes about the Punjabis, and uh, more than the jokes even of the Malayalis. I think the one group that has inspired the most amount of jokes is uh, we, uh, women. <laughs> so, uh, leaving jokes aside, when we look at uh, Christianity, we usually identify Christianity as a traditional religion. And it is understood that in traditional religions, in traditional cultures, uh, women are, in speaking in very blunt language, are seen as less fortunate. Among the Jews, I, I heard there is a proverb that says, it is better to be born a, a dog than a woman. Let's meet the Jews, okay? <laughs> but uh, we have uh, perhaps understood this, that uh, being a, a woman in a traditional setup has a lot of challenges, a lot of restrictions, a lot of discrimination. And uh, 
here is where today we want to uh, we want to look at our own lives and what scripture has to reveal to us what christianity christian theology and christian tradition reveals to you and me on what is being a woman now at many times at many times we could have uh, felt that we were at a disadvantage and uh, we were uh, perhaps restricted maybe at some point or the other we could have even felt that uh, we are not at all important and um, here is where when you you know when you look at what uh, our faith teaches us i'm talking about what the pure faith teaches us not of what people's opinions are it's actually quite revolutionary it's quite radical so um let's go into that now let's start at the very beginning a very good place to start now we're going to go into the bible and you go to the first page of the bible in the book of genesis chapter 1 uh, verse 27 genesis chapter 1 verse 27 uh, listen to this it says a uh, god created mankind in his image now if there were men also here apart from a few brothers but if there was a equal gathering of men then i would have used the inclusive language which i find very very burdensome uh, god created human kind in his image and then there's a stress it says uh, he, he in the image of god he created them god created human kind mankind in his image in his image he created them so when we look at this fabulous creation of god huh? amazing creation of god you just need to travel around or or at least look at channels that show you about a uh, creation and nature it's, it's it's amazing and yet in this vast great great creation of god what the or rather on earth the reflection of god the reflection of the face of god is humankind is mankind the presence of man on the earth is the reflection of god and here is where genesis 127 is not over it continues to say male and female he created them so i'm going through the verse again it says god created mankind in his image in his image he created them who's the them male and female he created them now here is where we see that male and female no together together we are created to reflect god when you say man is in the image of god very often we've taken it for granted and that okay you know you look at man god uh, god the father god the son god the holy spirit all represented as man and uh, you know so we look at man as that's what the bible says create in the image of god but here very clearly the word of god says male and female together together we uh, fulfill our, the purpose of our creation the purpose of your creation and mine what is the purpose of my life the purpose of my life the ultimate purpose which is going to give me that fulfillment of life is in reflecting god where i am wherever i am now it is very interesting now this is where you must listen it's very interesting that the very first mention the very first attribute of our human nature the very first attribute of even our divine nature because we all have a divine nature is our gender the first thing the first thing about us the the first teaching that god gives you and me about what is human nature the human nature that is in fact a divine nature is our gender now that's very uh, that's what i would call as for me it was mind boggling because until that time see when we uh, maybe that's one reason why when a baby is born the first thing they say is i have a healthy baby girl or baby boy there's some some perhaps some inborn wisdom in that now you know when we look at gender and sexuality femininity huh? when we look at femininity 
we realize from the scripture you and i must realize from the scripture that my gender my sexuality my feminine traits is not something dispensable it's not something despicable it's not something unspiritual it's not something being frivolous or it's not being uh, unholy it's not something of this earth that must disappear the fact is this it is through my femininity it is through your femininity that we will fulfill our mission our mission of reflecting god on this earth your mission in your home in your workplace in this city in this world happens through living out my femininity now what is this so what is this uh, femininity the femininity that through which i am supposed to uh, uh, live out my mission let me make a little confession apologies to the organizer <laughs> so when i saw this topic femininity i was seeing stars i thought my goodness what is this now because uh, i just didn't have a clue and i'm thinking how does anastasia get this and um and i was going on delaying preparing this topic because i was so nervous i just did not know i didn't have a clue about what this is i mean uh, of course yesterday when i mentioned to my sister in law she was rolling out things to me i'm like oh i mean not bad huh? i mean i have a lot of she has a lot of preaching practice at home you know she's got a husband and two sons and father in law mother in law so every day she is preaching so it's like she is like really versatile but when i saw it i was going on procrastinating because it was looking absolutely like beyond my uh, understanding and and when i sat to and when i had to sit to go through it i was so amazed i began seeing stars again <laughs> and so what you hear what you hear now from me is as new as it is to me is as um as life giving i pray as it has been to me and um, so when we uh, look at femininity what is femininity you know for me uh, i have two elder brothers and i grew up only with boys and so being a girl was to some extent a way of getting some perks and privileges so because i'm a girl you know i can't do all the hard work i can't go to the shop and buy things i can't carry the heavy luggage it's my brothers who have to do it but the fact is every one of us no matter how wonderful our families have been or not so wonderful our families have been every one of us in some area or the other we have felt disadvantaged we have felt discriminated we have felt challenged at some point of time though you're living in mumbai a wonderful city and uh, you have great inspirations here and all that at some point of time we could have thought if i was a man i would not have needed to do this right if i was a man imagine i am in kerala so the time if i was a man i would have just walked out at 10 o'clock and gone and got myself a cup of coffee i can make the cup of coffee in the room but you know so there are times when we felt challenged when we felt um, uh okay being a woman was difficult and i came across very interesting piece of news that female hummingbirds you know hummingbirds a tiny thing which female hummingbirds masquerade as males to avoid harassment and uh you and i are familiar there could be there could be uh, some of us who um in order to avoid harassment perhaps or in order to avoid uh, being put down subjugation oh uh, we have tried to be more manly because the man is the one who is the boss who makes the decision whom people uh, automatically respect in certain traditional uh, circles so we could have you know uh, found our femininity as a burden and um, because uh, very often perhaps we have uh, made our understanding of femininity as on a very superficial level so this morning we want to go from the superficial level to a spiritual level and let me warn you it's not going to exclude the physical expressions or the external expressions of being woman 
What are the external expressions of being a woman? Now you look at a little girl, huh? Now not all little girls are like this, but you look at a little girl who you know is uh, uh, longing to apply the lipstick and the blush that she sees her mother applying, and you say, ah, there's a lady. You know, someone who wants to put ornaments, you know, we put ornaments or maybe flowers or, or grow your hair long. We think, okay, that's being woman. Or sometimes we could associate womanhood with our, the figure of our body. So if someone is straight like a block, you say, oh, that's not like a woman. <laughs> that's actually because of the burgers. Huh? Or perhaps we could um, associate womanhood with a certain, uh, you know, a part of our body. So one lady came and told me some time ago that, oh, now I'm, I'm, I've lost my womanhood. I said, wow, <laughs> please reclaim it. <laughs> so we could have associated uh, femininity with uh, certain exaggerated body movements, you know. So there are many times and my mom has told me, why can't you be more gentle? Why can't you be more delicate? Why can't you be more like a girl? And I'm like, are you more like a girl? <laughs> so now is this wrong? I don't think so. But at the same time, it is wrong if, if I limit femininity to these few uh, expressions. If a, if, a little, if a little girl or a not so little girl is, you know, always having short hair or trousers or prefers to play rough games over playing with dolls or is one who speaks in bass tones, uh, we, we immediately label them as tomboys. I think for 20 years of my life, they all call me tomboy and I never felt like a tomboy. I mean, I, it was just one way of dressing. If you prefer wearing black and gray to red, then immediately think you're not feminine enough. So then it's a mistake. If you limit femininity to the, the length of the hair and the, the choice of clothes or the, the interests, uh, then it's, it's definitely uh, wrong. But it is, it is not wrong also, when our expressions as such is not wrong because I believe, uh, you know, sometimes, when you do, when you when you are trying, you know, when you wear flowers and when you wear big earrings and when you wear uh, not like this but bright clothes, if people say, "Oh, she is unspiritual," that is wrong. Again, the other extreme is also wrong because, sadly, we have limited spirituality to being pale, boring, and colorless. Now, the thing is that. I think the God who adorns the, the bushes, please come to Divine Retreat Center. The center is open. And you see a lot of flowers now because that's what we were doing during the lockdown. Had nothing much else to do. <laughs> so we did a beautiful garden. So you see plenty of, you know, and I look at those bushes. Every day when I walk to work, I walk through the garden. And you see a lot of green, boring green. And then you see some bright red, really bright red flowers. And I'm like... Where does God get these ideas from? And then there's this huge tree and, and right on top of the tree, for none of us to see are these, again, brilliant red flowers. Only God can see that. So this God who has this, you know, has this, has adorned these plants with the crazy and colorful and varied flowers, I think he has placed within you and me a sense of art where we, where we you not know, tend to adorn ourselves and ornament ourselves. There's nothing wrong and it, there's nothing unspiritual or less spiritual in, 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 in being, uh, what do you say, uh, very expressively uh, feminine. But when we look at these uh, characters, we also, as the theology of the body says, in John Paul II's extensive deep teachings, I'm just taking maybe one or two grains out of it. It says all these external expressions, all these external qualities are reflective of a deep and beautiful and, and strong and defining inward, inward character. So today we want to uh, go uh, un understand what is this, this inward spirituality, this deep spirituality that is there in our, our womanhood. Can I say hallelujah? hallelujah? 
Okay. Now here is, you know, it's, it's so fascinating as you learn Christian spirituality because there's something very unique about what the Lord has revealed to us in our faith. And, and this is the one difference, when I say unique, this is the one difference you see in Christian spirituality. In every other religious or spiritual line of thinking, philosophy, there is a clear division of body and of mind, spirit, soul. Some people say mind and soul, mind and spirit, whatever. So there is this, this distinction, this body on one side and the mind, spirit, soul on the other side. And in every other line of thinking, in every other spiritual philosophy, in every other religion, the body is seen as ungodly. The body is seen, now what we express, no? dust you are, dust you go back to. The body is seen as something that is to be done away with. The body is seen as a source of all trouble. <laughs> all the problems we have is because of the body. And what is spiritual? The mind, spirit, soul, whatever else. All that is intangible. In Christian spirituality, there's a vast, I mean the big shift. It takes, even for all of us who are traditional Christians, it takes time for this to sink in because in Christian spirituality, the body is, is very much at the heart of our spiritual existence. Of course, in the Bible, you read of flesh and spirit, you know, the, the, the struggle between the flesh and the spirit, or the flesh and the mind, but flesh in the Bible does not refer to the body. In Christianity, the body is, listen to this carefully, because I don't want you to misunderstand this. But in Christianity, the body is a sacramental revelation of God. Through my body, God is being revealed. I'm going to, I'm going to give you a few, uh, few uh, uh, you know, insights that are there in our spirituality. The first is this. God who is spirit, right? God is spirit. We read this in John 4. God who is spirit, God who is perfect, God who is sacred, takes on human form. And that is the first, first, you know, uh, affirmation for you and me that the body is sacred. And when he took on human form, he was not less God. Jesus is, we know by our, our Clear Catholic teaching and anything else is a heresy. Jesus was fully human and fully divine. Fully God. So having that, that flesh, having that body did not make him less divine. In fact, that was through that body, through his wounds, he would, uh, uh, he would achieve his mission of salvation. So the first thing we see is that God took on body. Secondly, you know, we're in the season of Easter. And we know in the resurrection, the Lord comes back to us, not as a blinding light. The risen Lord could have been something like a transfiguration, exp transfiguration experience. You see a brilliant light and you know, okay, this is Jesus, his voice. The risen Lord comes back as in, in the form of a body, a body that could be touched, a body that still bore the wounds of his earthly existence. When Jesus came to this earth, they were complaining about him. What was the complaint that he came? Eating and drinking. Hmm? There are some Pharisees, no? They don't like to see anyone eat. <laughs> Why are you giving samosas? You should have put holy water there, Anna. <laughs> now they complained about him that he came eating and drinking. But guess what? The risen Lord, what is the first thing he does? Get me some fish. <laughs> he shares a meal. Thirdly, he continues to want to be in our midst. How? through a physical presence. That means he wants us to touch him. He's telling us of the sacredness of touch. Did you touch your children today? 
Did you touch your husband today? Did you touch your parents when you visited them last? Next, we look at the assumption. Mother Mary was mother of God and there could have been many ways in which we could have honored her. But the church insists that she was taken up body and soul. Jesus preached to us of salvation and he did not speak only about the immortality of the soul. Your soul will live forever. What does he speak of? When he spoke of the passion, when he spoke of salvation, he spoke of the resurrection of the, of the, this is the first, uh, one of the first elements of our creed, the resurrection of the body. And now we're coming to the crux of what it, you know, even if you try to uh, make this very abstract and don't want to listen to it and say, okay, this is about Jesus. You know what the word of God says? In 1 Corinthians 6, 19, it says, don't you know, don't you know that your body, your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Look at your body, not now, in your mind. <laughs> This body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Now what is the temple? The temple is the place where God descends. Temple is a place where God comes in. And guess what? The temple is a place where God makes it his home. And thirdly, the temple is the place where we encounter God. Say hallelujah. 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 During lockdown, we could not go to church. Maybe we restrict church that half an hour. But through the day, imagine, I am, I am carrying the presence of God. I am having the temple of God with me. The temple of God is where I worship him. And therefore, what does the scripture mean? It means I need to, you need to honor your body. Honor your body. Don't despise your body. Take care of it. If you're unhealthy and you want to eat all those nice oily, sugary things, beat yourself. <laughs> but going to the depth of what is honoring the body, we have to go back to that, that passage in 1 Corinthians 6. And in 13, it begins like this. You know, it, 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 when, you, when you sit with those verses, it actually gives you... Some, quite a few good raps. You know what it says? A body. Eh? When I'm saying body, think of your body. It says, the Lord is for the body. And the body is for the Lord. You come to my house and you cannot think it's your house. It is my house. Now I'm in Anastasia's house. I almost feel it's my house. One fourth, one fourth of her property has become mine. <laughs> Tomorrow when I get kicked out, I'll know, okay, that is, that's actually Anastasia's. And that's the same with my body. My body belongs to the Lord. And my body is for the Lord. And then it says, and then it says, I'm, I'm just jumping verses from 13. Verse 15 says, listen to this, this is your bodies, where you are, that body you carry are members of Christ. So what should happen? People who touch you should get healed. Say hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. When you, you're going to come and sure some of you will come and ask me to pray for your children. I will. Surely I will. I'm not a mother but I can carry the pain of mothers. I'm very close to my mom. But your body, the next time you place your hand on your child, Place your hand on your child to pray over him or her. And know this, that your body is a member of Christ. And if Christ touches your child, you think the child won't be healed? And then in verse 18 it says, and that's where now it talks about what is honoring the body to the day. It says, every other sin is outside the body. So some people are only taking care of the sins outside of the body. It says, but one who commits sexual sins, whatever that is, whatever scientists and doctors and, and friends may say, 
The one who commits sexual sins, sins against his or her own body. You're hating yourself. You're not giving pleasure to yourself. You're hating yourself when you commit a sin against your body. And then finally in verse 20, I'm skipping 19, which we already went through, where 19 it says, your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Verse 20, it says, therefore glorify God in your body. Let your body be the channel of God's healing. Let your body give glory to God. Now, coming to, to femininity, very specifically this teaching is for us. Uh, you know, going back to that Genesis 1.27, God created mankind in his image, in his image he created them, then? And then? Male and female? He created them. So let's go through that again. God created mankind in his image. In his image, he created them and likeness. Thank you. That is, I think, a, but good. You know the Bible. And then male and female, he created them. So, not both. He created them. Hmm? Uh, according to NAB. Maybe some other version has both. Now, so what is this female that he created? Has a name, no? Yeah, no, no. Eve, yeah. So male and female, he created them. And, and then what happened to Eve is, she lost her femininity. She didn't go for a uterus removal. <laughs> she lost her femininity. She lost her Evehood. And so, we want to see who is the new Eve. Right from the third century, right from the earliest years, they presented for us because Eve fell. She's no more a model for us. She can no more instruct us on what it is to live that glorious call of, of being a woman, of reflecting the face of God through that first attribute that is my, my gender, my, my sexuality, my femininity. And so the church presents for us the new Eve whom God chose, and that is Mother Mary. We want to look at Mother Mary. We want to look at her. And, and here is where we see through Mother Mary. And I'm taking a few things from the scripture, from theology of the body. We see there are few attributes to what it is to being feminine. Now let's, let's, let's understand this. We cannot, you cannot dispense that call. You and I cannot ever stop being woman. Why? Because it is a sacred mission. And the first attribute of being woman or, or femininity, as, as uh, St. John Paul II would say, is that our first nature is a nature of being receptive as against defensive, as against reactive, as against resistance. Being receptive. The woman receives the seed of life. That's how you give, birth, give, give life. To be receptive. And, and what does this mean? What does this mean for every one of us? You know, uh, it is, you know, sometimes uh, when we look at the Bible, we could think, oh, that was a curse. She would have to bear children and conceive them and give birth to them and so much of pain. But let me, let me clarify this. Interpretations can blacken even the best of things. Now, if any of you, I'm sure if any of you have been in positions of responsibility, right? I'm in a position of responsibility. And precisely because of my important position, as I would understand it, for me it is important, it's where God has placed me, in understanding of what, how heavy and big my responsibility is, there could be people outside saying, I wish I was in her job. I wish I was in her place. But I want to tell you, because of my responsibility, because of my, bird, my, my position, I have a burden. Maybe 20 years ago, I was not in this, in this particular position and I had a more carefree life. But for me today, to take a day off is difficult. 
For me today, I don't have a Sunday free. I know you'll tell me, keep the Sunday holy. I'm keeping it very holy. <laughs> but I, I, I don't have maybe even 5% of the privileges and the perks that an average woman would have. But I'm happy about it. I'm so grateful. I, I'm so fulfilled. And if you are a mother, don't go and tell your child, do you know how much I suffered for you? Nine months, how much I went through? I couldn't eat, I couldn't stand, I couldn't bend. And do you know what pain it is? They say, no labor pain. Oh, I see some posts about how uh, extraordinarily, you know, how extraordinarily the suffering of labor pain is. We, we don't want to discount it, but that's the privilege. Don't ever think that you're going to get any privilege or position or, or responsibility if you're not willing to bear the burden of it, right? So much of burden, so much of pain, but it's, it comes with the title. If you are honored to be a mother, you must know that honor is not cheap because you have paid a price and till you die, you'll pay a price for it. <laughs> yeah. So, we see that, uh, <clears throat> so child, life giving is, yes, about childbearing, but what about us, the consecrated sisters, or me, uh, single for Christ, or, or some of you who perhaps are beyond the age of childbearing. So what does it mean for us? Do I not have a life giving mission? Guess what? A life giving mission, yeah, one fragment of it is giving birth to child, but... You and I, whether we are childbearing or not, <laughs> you and I, every day, we have, as a woman, I have a, my expression of my femininity is to be life-giving. And life-giving means the words I speak, the deeds I do, the decisions I make, everything about me should be to nurture others. To build others, to encourage others. Say hallelujah. Amen. We should not be people who are destroying others with our words. We cannot carry within us a power of hatred. Hatred kills. We cannot carry within us a power of revenge. Revenge destroys. We cannot carry within us prejudice, pride and arrogance. We, you and I, in our families, in your family, be it your daughter, your daughter-in-law, son-in-law, mother-in-law, whoever or who else, in-law, out-law, whoever, your workplace, my moment by moment, my daily mission, my momently mission is to see how I can build the other. I don't have a child because I'm not married. Huh? But I've had a lot of young people working with me over the years. And I'm, I'm so grateful for them. Variety of people. But through them, I have lived out my mission of being a woman. Why? Because my mission in each case is, whatever job they do or don't do, ultimately my mission to each one who comes to me is to see that they are healed, that they are launched into life. I may not always be successful. But to the extent that I can, in the place that I can, I need to do that. So the first, the first expression of femininity is to see that from this day, you no, know, you come for a woman alive, you're not coming just for a day out, you must come here to get blessed. Allow the blessing of God to flow through you and to continue to flow through you. Jesus says, a spring of life will constantly flow out of you. See that you live your femininity Apply the lipstick, apply the blush, look beautiful so that you can give life. Through your words, especially. Through your heart, through the way you're beginning to see others. Change your glasses. Third is, how do we give life? The only way of giving life, scripture says, John 12, 24, Jesus says, is through dying, through sacrifice. As a woman, I think right from the earliest years, we are oriented to sacrifice. We are oriented to miss out on things. Jesus says, unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, you will, it will not bear fruit. But if it falls and dies, it bears a hundredfold fruit. 
Friends, you know, we shouldn't complain about being sacrificing. Sometimes you look at your marriage and you think, I'm taking all the sacrifice. This guy is having a chill life. Right from earliest, you know, as an adolescent, perhaps, as a young girl, when your cycles began, you had to miss out, perhaps, on certain things. Not everybody did, but many of us had to, uh, we had to rethink the way we, we lived. So sometimes we are forced to stand by the show, stand on the fringes, and see others plunging into life when you become a mother. You have to give up everything. You have to give up your friends. You have to give up your, your social life. You have to maybe face a lot of setbacks in your career. But friends, that sacrifice is that privilege that you and I have for glory of God. It says, you know, those sacrifices, those interruptions in our life. Say, if I did not have a child, I could have done my master's or my PH. That interruption is where God could work through you. That interruption, it says, through the cracks, light seeps in. See, the people who are recorded in the history of salvation as the greats, you know, Abraham and Jacob and, Mo, uh, and Isaac, to, till this day, the Israel nation or the people of faith are known as children of Abraham. What was their mission? They were not political leaders. They were not kings. They were not strategists. They were not successful business people. What were they? Their mission was to father generation after generation in the faith. Say hallelujah. hallelujah. And as mothers and grandmothers, you know what? The, the propagation of faith, the, the continuation of life, the continuation of faith is through you. When a boy says he wants to marry a non-Christian girl, I have a little fear, but then I've come to see a lot of non-Christian girls being better Christians than us. But it is through the woman, through the mother that we receive faith. And here is where we see that um, in 2 Timothy 1.5, St. Paul is talking to Bishop Timothy. Who is Bishop Timothy? He's a man, a great man of faith. And who is he? He's a disciple of Paul. But what does Paul say? Paul is attributing the faith of Timothy to whom? To the mother and the grandmother of Timothy. And he says, I hope you have that faith. I recall your sincere faith that first lived in your grandmother Lois, in your mother Eunice, and I'm confident. I want to be confident. Lives also in you. When we look at the church... We could say, oh, the priest is at the altar. I'm so glad it's a man who's at the altar. Spares us of a lot of trouble, you know. But when you look at the church, look at who's there the Lord has raised up through for very important revelations. St. Teresa of Lisieux, St. Teresa of Avila, St. Catherine of Siena, not even a nun. St. Faustina, St. Teresa of Avila, Ma Mary Magdalene, they listened they were silent, they suffered, and they gave life to the church. Friends, the, the continuation of life God chose to do through women. You know why? The man may give his name, but in that continuation of life, you and I must give our body, our mind, our soul. We are fully involved in that mission. And uh, when we say, when we look at this, we see God has called you and me to be links be reconcilers. We are connecting one generation to the next generation of faith. And as mothers, you know, we have a, a, a mission to connect God to our family. Hallelujah. We are called to connect our, our one member to the other. And so the mission of being a woman, the vocation of being a woman, the femininity, the call of femininity is about being reconcilers and not dividers. Today, we need to check our hearts. We need to check our relationships. Am I bringing my family together? Or have I brought division? Let's give the Lord a mighty hand of praise for that beautiful insight Maria shared with us. Showing us the purpose of our lives, not just going to work or doing the mundane things of life, but purpose of our life is to reflect God, to be life-giving to each other and to our families. Amen.